Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. Ethical hacking for cloud security, best practices and tools. And I am Ritika Chakraborty and I will be your host for the day. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few house rules for our attendees. The session will be in listen only mode and will last for an hour out of which last 10 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A. If you have any questions during the webinar to the organizers or the speaker, use the Q&A window. Also, if you face any audio video challenges, please check your internet connections or you may log out and log in again. And very important announcement for our certificate of attendance. Participants need to attend the complete webinar to qualify for the certificate. Also should fill the survey form which will be sent in the attendees thank you email and answer correctly the three multiple choice questions based on the webinar. The certificate of attendance shall be sent to you within the next five to seven working days after the webinar. Now about our speaker. Santil has worked with various organizations throughout his 20 years of career, helping his customers solve their business problems and optimize their IT infrastructure. He is presently the staff cloud solutions architect at VMware and has previously worked with a multitude of technology partners including Druva, Amazon, Cisco and Microsoft. His grasp of network security fundamentals and the specifics of different technologies has allowed him to address the challenges of poor technological inter, uh, integration in an efficient, cost-effective and elegant manner. As a true champion of cloud technology and software as a service, he takes a minimalistic approach to technical management to ensure maximum output. So without any further delay, I would now hand over our session to you, Santil. Thank you, Hritika. Hi, everyone. Uh, Sentul here. I'm a staff cloud solutions architect for VMware, and I'm based in Sydney, Australia. I've been in the IT industry since 2002, so close to about 21 years now. I'm originally from Malaysia, and I have had the privilege of helping customers solve their complex IT problems. Over the years, my focus has been on security and how IT organizations can further optimize their IT spending and get the most out of the technology that they've invested in. My policy on IT is simple, keeping it simple and elegant. Today, I wanna to share my opinion on ethical hacking, more specifically on why it is important for improving your cloud security posture. We'll also explore some best practices and tools. Um, I'm here to learn and I wanna learn from you guys as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll try to answer them as best as possible. So let's get into it. Let us review what are the issues that is keeping the CIOs, uh, CTOs and CISOs up at night. And believe me when I tell you that they literally do lose sleep over these issues. Right. These are based on my interactions with CIOs, CTOs, CISOs on a day-to-day -day basis at work. Based on the report published by the CIO magazine, of the top eight priorities for CIOs in 2023, four of it relates to security and addressing vulnerability. The key takeaways of the report are, CIOs want to focus on building resiliency in technology and IT skills focusing on security, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. The possibility of a recession 
and labor shortage would put a lot of emphasis on technology being highly resilient and addressing the business challenges for the company. Second, um, they are also looking to cut spending and the low hanging fruit is the IT spend for legacy apps that are still left behind even after an organization has embarked on a journey of data modernization. This would allow the organization to relocate the funds towards primary business function, retiring legacy apps that allow the organization to secure the environments by minimizing the security attack surface and data exposure due to the legacy security design for these apps. Despite the uncertainty in economy and the push to reduce spending, organizations will still continue their digital transformation strategy. This involves moving workloads from the traditional data center to the cloud and also engaging SaaS vendors. What's certain is that more data is moving towards the cloud than ever and it's not going to go slow and it's not going to slow down. The CIO priorities report published by the Infotech Research Group where the survey asked the CIOs to identify themselves by playing both offensive and defensive strategy to come up for 2023. It reported that the CIOs will be going all in on zero trust security model. IT security is seen as a key pillar for continuous growth and adaption of the business to be ready for the challenges of 2023. Tasks include securing wider network footprints, identifying users external to the firewall, maintaining compliance with government and private institution regulators, and ensuring supply chain security. Meanwhile, the CISO Investment Priorities Report for 2023 conducted by the Osterman Research Institute lists out six key takeaways on cybersecurity. Regulation, digital channels, and economics driving cybersecurity. The growing use of digital channels for engagement of customers, employees, and partners mandate that these endpoints are properly secured. The top priorities for 2023 are cloud security, ransomware protection, and data protection. Cloud security and ransomware-based protection are the top two investments of 2023 from over 20 other areas, according to the report. This is despite every single media publications out there on economy that report that is reporting that organizations are tightening their budget and reducing their IT spending. You'll understand why this is the case when we review the global CTO survey of 2021 report. The report also looks at how board views cybersecurity has significant flow on effects. Board of the shareholders in the organization that view cybersecurity as a business risk show a greater proclivity towards proactive investment in cybersecurity. It's further revealed that among these boards, few would take a reactive approach towards cybersecurity threats. For an organization that pays attention to cybersecurity threats after a breach, of, after a breach or an incident, they view cybersecurity as a technical risk and they reluctantly approve the budget spending. So those out there in the business of selling security, it's important for you to determine how organizations view cybersecurity events. Is it business risk or is it technical risk? Better risk management leads to higher security prioritization and budget. Organizations with a greater ability to manage business risk associated with apps, cloud platforms, data, and on-premises infrastructure assign the higher security prioritization to the key issues associated with each area. I saved this one for the last, as I believe this takeaway is very relevant. Budgets have increased 11% since last year and are expected to increase further. The average budget increase from 2022 to 2023 on IT spend is 11%, with a further average increase of 19% forecasted for 2023 to 2024 budget cycle. This again falls back to an organization's risk appetite, business risk, or technical risk. Now let's look at the global CTO survey of 2021 report. This is a report that's done based on a survey that was conducted with over 500 CTOs across the globe. 
Um, this is based on a 2021 report. The 2023 report is, yeah, the survey for it is now closed. They are compiling the data and it'll be available soon. So reach out to me if you need this information. What it reported was one out of 13 companies that responded to the survey admitted to have been victim of a cyber cybersecurity event. And the biggest cybersecurity threat is the human factor, which is 59% followed by ransomware at 49.4% and phishing at 36.1%, sorry. Inadequate cloud security comes forth and it's at 29.7%. These are the top concerns by the CTO, of the CTOs. The bigger concern here is what I find alarming is that 55% of the respondents do not have any specific guidelines for our container security, and nearly half of the surveyed company have no ransomware protection. Let's peel this down a bit further. And I wanna apologize in advance. This is, there's gonna be a bit of stats and numbers on this page. I'd like to bring your attention to the cloud security report that was published recently. Based on the 2022 cloud security report that was published recently, 76 percentage of the respondent responded that they're using two or more cloud providers. The increased footprint in the cloud presents a unique problem. Security becomes a key priority. Concerns such as preventing misconfiguration, securing cloud apps, and ensuring regulatory compliance becomes a key focus. Out of these consumers of the cloud, 27% have experienced a cloud-related security event. It may not seem much, but it is an increase of 10% from last year. If you break this down further, 23% of the incident is due to incorrect resource or account configuration. 15% of the incident is due to data or files that are shared, by in, in, shared inappropriately by users. 15% is related to account compromise. These are because of passwords and um, you're not following the um, mandated password policy. 14% is due to an inherent vulnerability that was exploited by malicious individuals. These are on applications that are running in the cloud that you own. I get it. It's a lot of numbers to wrap around. But what does all this mean? We're looking at a situation where organizations need to take cloud security seriously as the trend does not look like it is going to slow down. In fact, the adoption of cloud is going to increase rapidly year on year. In 2022, the public cloud services grew by 20.4%. In 2021, that growth was only 18.4. For 2023, it is projected that, that this will increase to 20.7%. You might think that this is not a problem as you might not, as you, as you might believe that you're not in the cloud. Well, that, there's a bit of a misconception there as well. Even the most conservative of organization will have some form of hybrid cloud infrastructure footprint. As such, cloud security becomes very important as a number of cloud-related security incident does not show any sign of slowing down as well. You heard me speak so far that one of the major concerns that CTOs, CIOs, and CISOs have on their mind is about security. So the question then is, what are they doing to proactively improve the security posture? One of the most important best practice that they could employ is penetration testing. What is penetration testing or pen testing? These two words are used interchangeably throughout this presentation, but they mean the same. Penetration testing is a form of ethical cybersecurity assessment aimed at finding, investigating based on the findings report and remediating vulnerabilities identified in an organization's infrastructure and application. A pen tester employs the same technique and procedures as the cybersecurity criminals use in a genuine attack against an organization. 
conducting a penetration testing regularly allows the IT professionals in the organization to understand whether their security controls are secure enough to withstand these potential threats. There are many types of penetration testing that an organization could employ. Let's look at them briefly on what they are and their best practices. Infrastructure penetration testing, both internal and external. It is a test of the organization's physical and virtual infrastructure. These infrastructure can be on-prem or cloud-based network infrastructure that could include firewalls, system host, and various network devices in an organization. To identify the scope of the test as part of the best practice, you will need to know the number of internal and external IP addresses that you need to test, the subnet sites, and the number of sites that you want to test. Web application testing. It tests for websites and custom applications that are web-based, which is used by the organization. This test will help to identify flaws and vulnerabilities in the application codes, design and development, which can be exploited by cyber criminals. To identify the scope of the test as part of the best practice, again, you will need to identify the number of apps that require testing the number of dynamic and static pages that you have in your company, and the respective input variables that you'd like to test. These, are, these could be you know, um, text, um, text boxes or check boxes that is part of that static or dynamic web pages where you input those details in. So it's also important how those information is stored, and you also wanna uh, uh, run your tools to test whether if those information are being exposed in some way by the application due to lack of controls that are, or that are in place in the software designing process. Mobile application testing. This is the test that is conducted on the mobile applications running on Android and iOS systems. It will help to uncover authentication, data leakage, authorization and session handling issues. In order to determine the scope of the test, you need to identify the operating system types and its respective versions where the app is running on, the number of API calls, and the requirements for jailbreaking and root detection. Wireless penetration test. This pen test specifically targets the organization's WLAN, which is the wireless local area network, and other wireless protocols such as Bluetooth, ZigBee, and Xavier. With the outcome of the pen test, the security admin will be able to identify rogue access points, weakness in the encryption and the WPA vulnerabilities. This could mean that whether if the WPA password settings is a little bit smaller, so you don't, you, or it might not even have a password for you to join the network. In order to scope the test successfully, you will need to know the number of wireless and guest networks that are, that are being advertised in your organization, its locations, and the unique SSID that needs to be accessed. Build and configuration review. With this test, the pen tester will be reviewing the network builds and configurations to determine if there are any misconfigurations across web and app servers, routers, firewall, load balancers, and network accelerators. As the IT admin, you need to provide all the available versions of the Asriel document of the infrastructure. Well, if you're maintaining a single sheet, you just need to make sure that it is the current version. Details of the specific operating system and its patch level, which includes the versions of the operating system and the details of the application service, which needs to be tested. Agile penetration testing. This is the developer-centric vulnerability assessment that is designed to identify and remediate security vulnerabilities throughout the development cycle of an application. It helps to ensure that every product release, be it a minor bug fix or a major feature update, has been properly assessed from a security perspective. So this part of the testing might not be relevant for a lot of organizations, I think, because um, 
it only is relevant if your organization is involved in rapidly developing applications and, the, and you use a lot of internal apps for testing as well, testing and day-to-day -day operations. Social engineering. This is a test that is used to assess the ability of your systems and personnel to detect and respond to email phishing attacks. I can't stress this enough. Every organization should, at minimum, do this test every quarter or biannually. Given the stats that over 59% of CTOs confirm that the human factor is the weakest link, this test becomes even more imperative. Personnel that fail to test should be provided additional coaching on email phishing best practices. This test will allow the CIOs to gain insight of the potential risks through customized phishing, sphere phishing, and business email compromise attacks. Finally, and last but not least, is the cloud penetration testing. This is the custom cloud security assessment that will be done based on the organization's maturity in the public or private cloud. This test will help the CISO or the security professional uh, to overcome the misconceptions of the shared responsibility challenges by uncovering and addressing vulnerabilities across public and private cloud environments that will leave the organizations exposed. We'll talk about the um, shared responsibility model in the next slide, so we'll elaborate that a bit more. What are those boxes that you see there on the slide? Those white, gray, and black boxes. Well, these are some of the uh, options that you could use when you're doing your penetration testing. Any amount of information that an organization shares prior to the engagement of a pen tester can be classified into these three. The amount of information shared will ultimately determine the price of the engagement and also influence the outcome of the test. This can be classified as, again, white box or crystal or oblique box pen testing, gray box translucent or translucent box pen testing. Oh, sorry about the typo. This is black box pen testing. White box pen testing. What are those? Right, this one. This test is sometimes referred to as crystal or oblique box pen testing. This requires the sharing of full network and system information to the tester which includes network maps and credentials. It helps to save time and reduce the overall cost of the engagement because you're passing all the information about your organization to the pen tester. When should you do this type of test? This type of test is very useful to simulate a targeted attack on a specific system in the organization using as many attack vectors as possible. The gray box or the translucent box pen testing. This test, in this test, you provide limited information and you share that with your penetration tester. Usually this takes the form of login credentials, um, sort of password policies that you have internally within the organization. When you should do this type of testing? This type of testing is useful to help to understand the level of access a privileged user could gain and potentially damage the environment once they get the access. It attempts to strike a balance between depth and efficiency. This test is also useful to simulate the impact of either an insider threat or an attack that has breached the network parameter. So this, this means the malicious or bad actor has actually crossed your firewall. And we want to analyze what's the exposure of that um, penetration. The black box pen testing sounds a bit cool and a bit scary. No, in this pen testing, no information is provided to the tester at all. In this test, the pen tester follows the approach of an unprivileged attacker from initial access and execution through exploitation. This, off, this test is often seen as the most authentic type of pen testing 
as it attempts to demonstrate how a cyber criminal with no insider knowledge would target and compromise the organization. As such, a black box penetration testing is often the most expensive type of pen testing as well, because there's a lot of work for the pen tester to do. So he needs to plan out, he needs to look at all the information that he can get without any help from your end. So it takes a lot of time, hence it costs more. Research indicates that the gray box type of pen testing is often favored by CISOs and CTOs, as the potential cyber criminal will often attempt to conduct surveillance activities on the target organization, which will give them some information about the organization. Now, how this relates to the trainings or to, to the pol uh, regulation policy, right, uh, about social engineering, um, about how you stop your users to be more aware of phishing attacks, this is how the malicious or bad actor try to collect information, asking you to click an email, asking you to forward an email to somebody else, or um, he's going to come in and knock the door on the front door, try to gain, uh, try to get into a conversation with your staffs in the organization uh, to try to gain some additional uh, information that's going to allow him to uh, simulate a larger attack in your organization. So um, based on the report, a lot of them do the gray box uh, type of pen testing because it's a bit of a balance between both worlds. As a best practice, an organization should conduct a pen test at minimum once a year. Additionally, they can increase the frequency based on any significant changes to the infrastructure. It's also a good idea to do penetration testing prior and post a merger or acquisition. So it helps you understand the vulnerabilities of an organization that you're buying and also what, your, what is your posture before the merger. If your organization has frequent software releases and updates, You'll gain more by employing an agile pen testing, as it will help to secure your environment proactively that aligns to the product release cycle. So you don't need to go out, expose the product, get users to try it, and then find the vulnerability. You could proactively test it before it goes live, before you roll out, roll it out to a production environment. Now, this usually requires you to have a dev test environment, and that's essentially the best practice as part of the software development lifecycle anyway. Well, let's talk about the shared responsibility model, right? These are all great. Do any of the pen tests above that we talked in the previous slide regularly and you should be covered, right? Or is it? Let's look at the stats and determine whether if the organizations are keeping up with the shift of IT trends. Based on the 2023 pen testing report, 86% of the security professionals test their external infrastructure. It's no surprise that they focus on these external networks as it constitutes all of its public facing assets, right? These could be your network devices, routers, switches, and et cetera. With the explosion of internet and external communication, the external infrastructure are inherently more exposed. There's no denying that, right? And that it, it makes sense that it is the highest amount of, it, it takes the highest amount of percentage. 72 percentage of the security professional poll responded that they pen test their internal network as well. It's a bit unusual, but given that most of the CIOs consider human error as their primary reason for malicious events in the organization, the data obtained makes perfect sense. However, the worrying statistic of the report is that only 46% of the security professionals conduct pen tests of their cloud workloads when the greatest common threat that is observed for cloud-based services it's misconfiguration of services that invariably allows a cybersecurity criminal to breach an organization's internal application and steal that data. One of the main reasons why this could be the case is probably due to the confusion around the shared responsibility model provided by these cloud service providers. It's often a misconception that as organizations adopt a more cloud-first approach, the responsibility of securing the data and application falls on the shoulder of the cloud security provider. This misconception is true for both public cloud service provider, such as AWS, Azure, GCP, Alibaba, and other private cloud service provider as well. The users of these, private cloud service, of these cloud service providers, both public and private, have the same misconception. 
Well, it's not entirely false. As part of the cloud service provider's shared responsibility model, the cloud service provider is indeed responsible for the security. But the question is, where did this stop? Where does it begin? They are responsible for the infrastructure where your application is being hosted on. So the underlying physical infrastructure, right? As observed in the cloud um, shared responsibility model, sorry, cloud shared responsibility model. Just give me a second, one minute. As observed in the cloud security uh, shared responsibility model, certain aspects of the components such as access control and data and application falls within the scope of the customer. So all those that are green, these all falls within the responsibility of the customer. For IS, you're, the customer is responsible for user access and identity. They are also responsible for data. They are also responsible for application that's running on that. They are also responsible for the operating systems. IS. Uh, is infrastructure as a service. So essentially you're buying a whole bunch of infrastructure from a service provider and you're running everything on your own. For PaaS, platform as a service. Um, uh, users are responsible for user access and identity. Data application. Uh, the service provider is responsible for all the other layers. For customers that use SaaS, right? So you, you might think that you're not even a cloud consumer. Um, you, you are still inherently responsible for user access and identity and also the data that you put into your system. So this could be Salesforce and Microsoft 365 and all the other stuff, right? You should know that all major public cloud service providers such as AWS, Azure, GCP, Alibaba and Google do permit penetration testing relative to what you're using them for. They have a list of permitted services that you can run this test on. Their rules of engagement can be found in each of their websites. You need to refer to your service level agreement that you've signed between the organization and your organization and the service provider as it will define the type and the scope of cloud penetration testing that is allowed it and how frequently you can do the cloud penetration testing. So you need to go back and refer those. But it's very important that you understand the shared responsibility model. And I can't emphasize this enough. Just because you moved your data from your on-prem environment to the external environment, it doesn't mean that you passed on the responsibility. It doesn't work that way. Here are the four phases of uh, cloud penetration testing. Right? What are the four phases? The first phase is the preparation. In this phase, no actual testing takes place during the preparation phase. You'd obtain testing approval. Organizations management reviews the proposal process for penetration testing and, doc and documents its approval of the testing exercise. You would clearly define the goals of each um, penetration test, security risks and resource availability will potentially impact these goals as well. The preparation phase is critical to setting the pace of penetration testing and influencing its broader outcomes. The second part, which is the scanning, is typically broken into two parts. In the first part, the IT personnel will deploy tools that will allow them to identify running services in the organization protocols used by these services, ports used by these services, credentials, and et cetera. Examples of tools and methods used would be port scanners, interrogating DNS servers to learn about host domain, who is tool to query internet network information center or publicly available domain information, sniffing the network to determine host specific network traffic, uh, details about the organization's employee and the contact information, a sourced from the directories that is available, system and device information are obtained using NetBIOS and NIS assistance. Um, I've seen customers who do who physically walk through the facility 
to identify any vulnerabilities such as written passwords on post-it notes know, that they stick on the desktop or the monitor. Trust me, I've seen it. In the second stage of scanning, the data that is obtained from part one are analyzed to generate actionable insights about potential vulnerabilities. These, these process that, we, the, that is involved in the scanning is mostly automated, but at some point you do, do, you do need to do some manual work. The third phase uh, is the actual crux of the um, process, which is to conduct a simulated attack. The entire testing phase of the penetration testing is focused on exploiting the vulnerability that has been identified through the scanning and implementing appropriate remediation strategies to address these vulnerabilities. Successful implementation of the testing largely depends on the findings captured in the discovery phase, which is part of the preparation. It will then drive the four parts of the simulated attack. The four parts of the attack penetration testing include, so this, this, it's broken down, the testing phase is broken down in, into four further steps or four further sub phases. Obtain system access based on the vulnerability analysis conducted in the discovery phase of the penetration testing. The pen tester will attempt to gain to the target system. Launching an attack to gain system access, it is best practice for pen testers to exploit multiple vulnerabilities when attacking a system verify and report successfully exploited vulnerabilities and identify the minimum access level required for cyber criminals to breach the system. So we're not looking at the highest privilege, we're looking at the lowest privilege that we can use to get into the system. Escalate privileges. So once you gain access, once you gain the first step, it's like a Trojan horse, once you gain the first step, how do you, how do you maximize the attack surface? How do you explore and escalate that privilege that you've obtained. If the first stage of the attack phase is successful with the user level access that's been obtained, a pen tester then attempts to gain a higher level of administrative access. If privileges are successfully escalated during the penetration testing, then INIST recommends that a pen tester test to conduct additional testing to identify the risk level faced by the target assets and expand the testing to other assets that can be potentially compromised. Now it keeps going, it keeps getting better. You try to gain additional system access as well. Further testing and analysis are conducted in the third stage of the attack penetration testing to determine the possibilities of exploiting more vulnerabilities across target assets and accessing more sensitive areas of IT environments. This is the classic approach often employed by cyber criminals, land and expand. The final stage, is expanding the penetration testing even further. So it involves you in, involves the penetration tester of a, installing additional sets of tools to aid further testing of targeted assets. So once he's done all that, he's going to he's going to try to install an application that's going to sit quietly in there and start to call home. So that app is going to sit there and start exploiting more and more vulnerabilities it, it, it identifies in your organization. In practice, the third or the fourth pages, uh, fourth phases of the uh, system are usually done together, which is the gain additional system access and expand the pen testing environment. The last part, uh, which is the reporting, uh, it's the final phase. Uh, it involves reporting the vulnerabilities identified during the penetration testing um, to, ex to guide vulnerability remediation. Reporting is not necessarily final as it occurs during each phase, and it's critical to the success of the penetration testing exercise. So, but it, overall, reporting comes at the very end. Uh, the reporting part itself will involve a, a, a few steps. Documenting an assessment plan. An assessment plan is developed during the planning phase of the penetration testing. It's based on rules of engagement agreed upon by the pen tester and the organization that's been tested. Scope of content contracted penetration testing services. So it depends on how much you've scoped them for. Reporting of vulnerability testing and analysis. All penetration testing activities and corresponding results from the discovery and attack phases should be logged and recorded, ensuring proper storage of testing logs and vulnerability reports, 
oversight of reporting activities by organization management, submission of the report to designated authority within the organization. Post-testing write-ups. At the end of the penetration testing exercise, the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, recommends that pen testers compile a report of vulnerabilities identified during the penetration testing, risks derived from the risk assessment, vulnerability, and gap remediation recommendation. So you've done all that, you compiled it, you now need to present that back to the organization so they can take the relevant action. What are the tools and requirements, right? So there are various penetration testing tools in the market. Some of the categories or services provided, let's look at them individually, vulnerability assessment and the penetration testing, network scanning and protocol analysis, vulnerability probing and weakness detection. So this looks at um, what are the weaknesses of an app, right? Vulnerability scanner, so it, ex it actually scans for dangerous programs and the multiple portals, ports that these apps open as part of them, as part of them functioning and giving you the outcome that you need. But application penetration testing, automated penetration testing tool and SQL injection attacks. So these exploit SQL injection flaws within a system as well. Last but not least, um, you'd also need an individual that's properly certified, right? So ethical hacker certification from a reputable organization such as EC Council would be very helpful. There are certain programs that EC Council offers such as a certified ethical hacker, certified penetration testing professional, computer hacking and forensic investigator, certified network defender, and certified cloud security engineer. Uh, reach out to me as well if you want to speak to someone about conducting these tests. Okay. And that's the end of the um, session. Um, any Q and A's, guys? Um, Hitika, back to you. You there? Thank you, Central, for the wonderful session. We actually don't have much uh, question but people are actually appreciating the session they are telling it's a very good session oh, so thank you. Uh, thank you. yeah so uh, before we get started with the q a today's webinar is in sync with our ceh certification easy council ceh maps to many ethical hacking roles in the industry like security analyst, information security analyst, certified ethical hacker, security uh, consultant, site administrator, and network management executive. Anyone with CEH certification is eligible for 18,000 plus number of immediate job openings with an average salary of 90,000 to 110,000 per annum dollar sorry dollar per annum if you are interested to know more kindly take part of in the poll that's going to be start right now so let us know your preferred mode of uh, training and we will reach out to you so santil shall we start the q a Sure. So our first question is, uh, any specific tools you would advise in the cloud penetration testing? Uh, so there are a lot of tools out there, right? So um, I, I, I won't say specific tools. Um, what I, I wanna try to draw example, um, cause it will be very relevant, relevant um uh to you guys all right so not getting into the specific names but for example so you can reach out to aws aws uh, has its own penetration testing tool that that is offered as part of a service and they have what's what's called this approved list of services that you can actually test the same applies for um for microsoft as well azure uh, gcp has a, um, an additional advantage to it 
uh, GCP actually offers rewards um, if you find those vulnerabilities and report it back to them. So they actually give you vulnerabilities. Alibaba does the same as well. Um, and private cloud providers as well, right? Um, so private cloud providers, I can't really comment because you got to use your external tools. But um, what's important is that you got to review your um, SLA and you got to identify what's your scope because you can't just go in and test everything. And there's also a demarcation of um, what the testing constitutes. So for example, all these public cloud service providers, they've already done their internal penetration testing and they have what they call as a penetration testing report for the infrastructure and the physical layers that they host. Anything more than that, it's yours. So you come in and you run your report, you run your, uh, you run your test, whatever vulnerabilities that you identify, you go and fix it. So not necessarily tools, but um, you can reach out to me personally, we can um, talk about specific tools name, but um, these are available online as well, right? As part of the scope of engagement, um, all these public cloud service providers have, have their rules of engagement that you can use to, to do those tests. Okay, actually. And, um, um, I, and I'll share with you one interesting aspect, right? Of, of, of why, um, you know, we talked about best practices and recommendations for you to um, run the test at least once a year. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, this was from a customer that we've spoke to recently, and I'm not sure how many of you guys are actually paying this. So this is called a cyber risk or cyber security insurance. So uh, the customers uh, engage the cyber security uh, insurance company and they pay a whole bunch, a whole bunch of money for the cyber security risk, right? So if they do get hacked or if they had a malicious accident, they can go and um, get compensated back, at least to recover or to use that to recover the business back. Because you know any impact to the uh, data is a loss of revenue. Now what they've discovered. By running the penetration testing, these um, insurance agencies actually offer a lower premium if you are able to provide the pen testing report and show them that you've um, addressed those vulnerabilities. So by going and engaging a pen tester, you'll be paying money, but you realize that in an overall picture, you're actually reducing your IT spend as well because your insurance um, cost for this um, to this insurance company is part of your IT expenditure. So uh, guys, uh, the speaker actually unable to hear me. So I am going to write the uh, questions to him so that he can take one by one questions. Sorry for the inconvenience. It is a technical glitch, I guess. Yeah, I've got a question. That's, I'll read it out. So if a pen tester does a pen test and does not pick out a vulnerability that eventually gets exploited by bad actors, Will the pen tester be legally liable for damages due to the breach? Are there legal protection for pen test engagement? Um, that's a good one, actually. Uh, I've not heard of it yet. So, so how I see this happen, right? So the agreement between yourself and the pen tester works two ways. A lot of times it's um, uh, non-disclosure uh, non and confidence, confidentiality report that you sign and the pen test assigned. So right? what, if you're a large enough company, whatever vulnerability that they identify, they can't go and tell everybody else. So that, that's one of the key things that they do. And a lot of times what they're doing is they're in, uh, you, you are engaging them in confidence that they will be able to identify and tell you the vulnerabilities uh, that is um, available within your application and organization. So I think the agreement that you signed protects the pen test a bit more because he's actually doing work for you. You're contracting him and you're doing this in confidence based on his reputation, right? So you're not gonna go and pick a pen tester that you've heard of a Google review. You're gonna probably go and look for one that other organizations have used or other organizations recommend. So I think uh, that's how I would look at it. I don't think that, you know, if, if 10 months or six months after a pen tester does his work, because uh, the situation is so fluid, right? Because the application changes, your data changes, your data point changes. So for you to go back to him and tell, hey, um, you did this six months ago and now I've been ex exploited and you said I didn't get any, I didn't have any vulnerability. They might just use it back to you and say it's been six months. 
So you got to do it every quarter or every 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 often based on um, your applications that you use. Our second question was for an organization for an organization, what type of pen test is more preferred? White box, black box, or gray box? Um, secondly, usually how much time the security company vendor takes to provide a security report on black box, pen testing and how they extract information. So based on my engagement, um, I'll be very upfront. I've seen a lot of customers use gray box because um, a black box, though it is the most authentic form of pen testing, it rarely happens, right? Because an attacker, if he wants to attack your organization, he'll do surveillance. He'll tie sending you phishing emails. He'll he'll physically try to come into your building to try to engage your uh, your uh, staffs. He'll he'll try to collect information externally. Uh, he'll potentially try to even become a customer. Uh, there's been a case, and um, we've spoken to this customer. The hacker or the individual or the cyber criminal was also a vendor uh, of this organization. So by them being a vendor they were able to get some additional information right so a gray box is usually what i i would recommend in my personal opinion and um how long they would take would depend on um your organization right um so i, I it, it really depends on the size of organization and the scope of the engagement So that's my take. Um, that's another one. Uh, what are the compliance and regulatory requirements that organizations need to consider when conducting pen testing for an application hosted on managed Kubernetes clusters by AWS or Azure? And how they can ensure that they're meeting this requirement? Um, and what are the compliance or regulatory requirements that organizations need to consider? Yeah, okay, it's the same question again and again. Um, so, uh, I'd say um, go to Azure or go to AWS. They have a list of approved services specifically for Kubernetes. I know this. Um, and they have rules of engagement on what you can test. That link and the whole detail is publicly accessible. If you want, uh, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn. I could give that LinkedIn um, uh, the link to you. It's available. So it's available. Uh, it, they focus specifically on some of these workloads. And I know Kubernetes is there as well. It's one of the lists of approved services that you can test. So um, they will stipulate what's the rules of engagement there. As another one, is cloud penetration testing completely based on misconfiguration and security misconfiguration? Otherwise, is there anything more than that like mobile and web app pen testing? Yes, there is. Uh, in the slide, you, you, you would have noticed um, there's also pen testing that's done for mobile, uh, mobile, uh, be it Android, be it iOS, because um, you'd find that um, the uh, a sales organization, um, a lot of them that go out and sell product, the sales executive have uh, mobile apps and tablets that they need to put in the order and the details, right? So you need to test that as well. So for that, and for perhaps a lot more, so. Companies do, um, you know, they provide mobiles nowadays. They provide laptop nowadays, right? So they need to test this as well because the user is using a company uh, resource for also his personal use, right? Some might have two different uh, handphones, but some, a lot of them use a single handphone, which is an handphone that belongs to the company. So yes, there is a penetration testing for mobile and web app. That's a great question, right? Um, and that's uh, and this one. Um, it's how cloud pen testing is different from standard pen testing. And that's the whole premise of this discussion, anyway, right? So the cloud pen testing um, takes on a modern approach, right? Um, versus the standard pen testing looks at the um, is, is more limited and assumes that you don't have any physical or any cloud footprint or, uh, or a footprint that's away from your primary infrastructure. So it looks at your physical environment, it looks at your firewall, 
it looks at your switches, it looks at your routers, it looks at your AP access points and etc. And it, it it tries to test that. It tries to test what's the last gateway point for you and the internet. It, it doesn't do anything else. Uh, versus the cloud penetration testing is the one that you need to look at because it, it, it is what you need to do based on the shift of technology. Whether you like it or not, you are a consumer of cloud. Right, so you need to be able to do cloud penetration testing because you want to see and address those vulnerabilities. So if you're running workloads in AWS, if you're running workloads in Azure, if you're running a web services in Azure or AWS or GCP, right, you want to test that vulnerability of the application server that's running in there. It could be running on as an native EC2 service, right, or an Azure VM workload, but still you need to test. So that's why. Uh, that's how cloud penetration testing is inherently different from a standard physical uh, standard penetration testing. Uh, last question, guys, and then we'll close it, and we'll uh, that'll be the end of the uh, session. So, last question. Yep, last question here. As a customer, how do or can we evaluate the skill of a pen testing? Like he himself is a script kitty or having a high level of skills. Um, I, I'd say um, this answer, and this is me taking uh, and putting me in the shoe of an organization, I would never go for a kitty. I would go for a reputable organization out there that has proven case studies. Uh, I would also go and try to talk to my colleagues in other industries, because usually a CISO or a CIO does this. So I'd refer and I'd usually go for a referral instead of going for a company uh, that just started or uh, someone that's a script kitty. So you don't want to give your critical data to these individuals. So that's a no-no. And that's it, guys. Um, reach out to me uh, if you want to ask any other additional questions. I'll be happy to entertain them. But um, that's it for the day, and we're closed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sante.